Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today's video is not the usual sort of content I make on the channel. It's going to be more a discussion addressing some of the common misconceptions about HDR technology that I hear in comments and forum posts and I guess all that sort of thing. I guess as more HDR monitors become available and as I get into reviewing the ASUS PG27UQ, it's important to know what exactly you need to look for when purchasing an HDR monitor. So I'm going to talk about that today. Don't expect too much beer roll or anything like that, just a nice juicy talk about HDR. The things I'll be talking about in this discussion come from a number of sources. Firstly, my personal experience using HDR monitors and TVs of all kinds, but also key people in the industry involved with developing HDR displays, working on HDR support for GPUs and that sort of thing and also validating HDR monitors not just for consumers but also for movie studios in Hollywood so a lot of information from a variety of people is going to go into this video and as far as I'm concerned there are three main pillars to HDR technology you've got your color space brightness and contrast and it's important to note how these pillars to HDR improve the viewing experience relative to SDR tech which has been used, I guess, for a long, long time now. I'm going to start with brightness because this is the area I hear, I guess, the most misconceptions about. Common things that people say include, you know, uh, HDR monitors need to support a thousand nits of brightness or 400 nits of sustained all white brightness isn't high enough. And even, you know, it's not real HDR unless it's 4,000 nits. And all of those statements aren't really true. So it's really important to know exactly how brightness affects HDR content and what to look for in a monitor's brightness specifications to ensure sure your HDR capable display is well suited to HDR content. Most of the discussion on HDR brightness comes from two misconceptions of sorts. The first around what people believe to be high levels of brightness and what isn't, and the second is around what companies are mastering their content for, and they're both kind of intertwined. It is true that the HDR standards like HDR10 and Dolby Vision have brightness targets and maximum levels ranging anywhere from 10,000 nits to 1,000 nits. It's true that many studios creating HDR content are mastering their content for high levels of brightness like 4,000 nits and it's also true that plenty of high-end TVs can currently produce well above a thousand nits at peak. So how relevant is this stuff for monitors in particular? Well firstly on HDR standards and mastering it's not necessary for your display to support the full range of the standard or the exact specs used in the content mastering so long as your display is able to correctly map from a wider brightness range down to whatever the display supports. There are differences in how HDR displays handle this mapping, but as long as it's done, I guess, to a reasonable degree and everything is scaled or clipped properly, the content will look pretty good on a display that can't hit those super high levels of brightness. Of course, if the display does a bad job, you might run into issues like standard brightness areas being too dark as you know everything gets scaled down inappropriately, or you might run into severe clipping at the top end of the brightness scale with significant detail loss. Luckily for gamers on HDR monitors, this is less of an issue compared to video content as most gamers include scales and sliders to adjust how the HDR image looks on your TV and it allows you to get the most out of your display's capabilities. Now, if your display can show high levels of brightness like 4,000 or even 10,000 nits, that's great, higher is better, but lower levels of brightness aren't nearly as bad as you might think. The difference between 1,000 nits and 4,000 nits sounds massive, and the difference from 600 nits to 4,000 nits even larger, but the human eye is non-linear in the way it perceives brightness. In other words, while the jump from 1,000 nits to 4,000 nits sounds like a four times increase, the eye does not perceive 4,000 nits as four times brighter. It will perceive a four times difference between, say, 50 nits and 200 nits, but as brightness increases, your eye becomes less sensitive to large changes in light output. The result is 4,000 nits only appears to most viewers as a small increase over 1,000, despite the large change in number. Crucially, for HDR monitors, the effect also applies below 1,000 nits. According to some experts I spoke to that are involved with professionally testing HDR displays, the difference between 600 nits and 1,000 nits in a typical viewing environment for a monitor isn't all that large. In fact, many viewers will only notice a small difference or even no difference between those two brightnesses in an indoor artificially lit room and that's where most monitors are viewed. The difference gets even harder to spot in dark environments like with the lights off. Another important factor in this is that monitors are viewed at closer distances than TVs. A relatively large TV viewed from a typical couch distance in a brightly lit living room during the day 
requires a much higher brightness output to deliver the same HDR effect as a monitor viewed more closely and in a more dimly lit room. So while a TV may benefit from say 4,000 nits of peak brightness, a monitor could give an equivalent viewing experience with 1,000 nits or less. One expert I spoke to suggested that for monitors, the difference between 600 nits and 1,000 nits of peak brightness is far smaller than most people realize in typical viewing environments, and that 600 nits should be perfectly adequate for a good HDR experience, provided the monitor hits several other key metrics we'll talk about later. Even 400 nits of peak brightness could be fine in some scenarios, although most people believe that around the 600 nits mark corresponding to the display HDR 600 specification is your safe spot, I guess, for great HDR, with 1,000 nits or more providing a small improvement on that. The other very, very important thing to note is the difference between peak brightness and sustained brightness. I hear a ridiculous amount of complaints about HDR monitors rated for 1000 nits or 600 nits of peak brightness being incapable of displaying that level of brightness across the entire display in a full white image for a sustained period of time. The complaints usually paint those brightness figures as false advertising when the monitor might only be able to push 300 nits across the full white image. The truth is that for almost all content you'll actually view on the display, the full white brightness figure is irrelevant, and for HDR in particular, it's the peak brightness figure that matters. If you think of content you typically view like a game, a TV show, or movie, how often is the screen entirely white? Very rarely. And then on top of that, how often do you think a content creator working in HDR wants to display a full white image at an eye scorching 1000 nits for a long time? And the answer to that's pretty much never. So the reason why HDR needs high brightness levels is for flashes of brightness. High brightness enables you know, the intensity of the sun to burn through, the flicker of fire to illuminate the screen, or an explosion to rock your eyes, more closely matching how those things are experienced in real life. To show those elements in their full glory, you only need a display capable of pushing high levels of brightness in a small area or for a short period. A thousand nits in a 10% white area, along with the ability to show a thousand nits across the entire display for a split second, those are typical metrics for HDR, is fine for 99% of HDR content. And it's these metrics that the peak brightness figure you see in HDR monitor specs refers to. And like I said earlier, you don't even need that figure to be a thousand nits, instead 600 nits is fine. If you want to look further into why high levels of sustained brightness is not required, you should look into a metric called average picture level or APL, which describes the average brightness of a complex image. For a lot of video content and games, the APL is actually pretty low relative to full white images. It's only really in desktop usage, like browsing the web or editing documents, that you run into high APL content. And for that, you really don't want a high level of brightness. Trust me, viewing web pages at even just 400 nits on a monitor in indoor conditions is pretty painful. So for brightness, there are a couple of things you need to look for. Don't worry if the monitor can't sustain high levels of brightness. 300 nits or so is fine. But to be on the safe side, I'd recommend looking for 600 nits of peak brightness as a minimum, with 1000 nits providing a small improvement. If you are planning to use the monitor in a brighter, more well-lit environment, having high levels of peak brightness like 1000 nits will benefit you more, but for most users, 600 nits is fine. You might be wondering, will you get a good experience with a 400 nit monitor meeting the display HDR 400 spec? Well, the answer to that is maybe, but there are a few other issues with the display HDR 400 spec that we'll get into in a moment that leads me towards recommending the higher display HDR 600 spec as a minimum. And at least in my experience, 600 nits is a noticeable jump from 400 nits and worth upgrading to. And I've found that monitors that can hit 600 nits are more likely to support other key HDR features that 400 nit monitors often do not. For the second of the three pillars, contrast, I think most people are on the same page with this one. One of the key benefits to HDR is its ability to display bright areas and dark areas on the screen at the same time, giving you that you know, stunning difference between the dark shadows of a street with the bright street lights, for example. This range of brightnesses or dynamic range is higher than with SDR imagery in HDR, hence why it's called high dynamic range. As with most things, higher contrast is always better, but the key thing to note with HDR is that you really want a contrast ratio that exceeds 5,000 to 1 for the best results. Even 10,000 to 1 is really sort of around that mark. So there is a significant difference between the brightest brights and the darkest blacks. Basically, every monitor uses an LCD panel, and even the best LCD panels out there using VA technology can't really push that much above 3,000 to 1 contrast ratios or thereabouts. Therefore, to produce a good HDR, a display needs to support a technology called local dimming. 
what local dimming provides is instead of getting the crystals in the LCD panel to attenuate the amount of light passing through, as with standard LCDs, local dimming augments this by also allowing sections of the backlight itself to dim. When you combine a backlight that can dim in certain sections with the inherent design of LCDs, you can achieve very high contrast ratios. Ideally, you'd want the backlight to be dimmable on a per pixel level. However, that's not currently possible outside of expensive industry reference monitors. So the next best thing is to have as many dimming zones as possible. You've probably heard of the new G-Sync HDR monitors supporting 384 FALD zones or full array local dimming zones. And that's a good number for a monitor size display. You'll get a great HDR experience with that amount of backlight control. There's no exact number for how many zones you need for good HDR, aside from more is always better. But it's pretty clear that if you only have a few zones, say a single digit amount like six, that the HDR experience from that won't be great. Most displays that support local dimming will advertise it as a feature, so my advice is to look for local dimming support and then try and research the amount of zones the backlight has. If that number is reasonable, at least upper double digits, you'll be on your way towards good HDR. And it's also important, I guess, to avoid monitors that only support edge local dimming rather than full array, though most high zone count displays will already be full array dimmed. Unfortunately, the display HDR tiers don't have rigid specifications for the amount of local dimming zones, while the 600 and 1000 tiers must support local dimming in some form to meet their contrast ratio metrics, low zone edge lit dimming does qualify. Meanwhile, local dimming is not a requirement for display HDR 400 at all, so be wary of that tier. Color gamut is the third pillar of HDR, and again, I think most people understand what is required here. True HDR monitors should be able to display more colors than SDR monitors. HDR standards are future-proof in this regard in that they support way more colors than current display technologies can show. For example, the ridiculously massive BT 2020 color space, but realistically, so long as the display can show a decent amount more colors, you'll notice the difference in color depth and vibrance compared to an SDR display. With today's monitor technologies in mind, you should be looking for monitors that support at least 125% of the sRGB gamut used for SDR. Usually, that will mean upwards of 90% DCI-P3 coverage. Of course, larger is always better, so long as the display properly maps colors to what it can produce. Monitors that are validated to the display HDR 600 tiers and above are guaranteed to support 90% of the DCI-P3 gamut or more, so you should again be looking for those badges. However, display HDR 400 is a bit dodgy in that it doesn't stipulate a higher than sRGB color gamut, so be wary of that. Most monitors that use quantum dot technology will hit those higher gamuts too, so that's a good thing to look for. One misconception I do hear quite often though relates to 10-bit color. 10-bit color is a requirement for HDR, so all monitors that support HDR will at least be able to support 10-bit data input for processing. Essentially, this gives the monitor greater color depth and a wider range of colors compared to 8-bit processing, which again improves image quality. However, what isn't required is a true 10-bit panel. This is a professional grade feature only needed for people mastering content and doing other color critical work. It's also an expensive technology to include with most true 10-bit panels starting at well over $1,000 without any fancy features like high refresh rates or local dimming backlights. Some don't even support HDR in its you know, true things that we've been talking about today. Most HDR monitor panels supporting 10-bit color will display these colors using a technique called frame rate control, or FRC, on top of an 8-bit panel. You'll find it very difficult to tell the difference in any real-world scenario between true 10-bit and 8-bit plus FRC. It's much harder to notice than panels that use 6-bit plus FRC to achieve 8-bit colors, for example. For gaming and viewing video content, 8-bit plus FRC is basically a non-issue, so don't worry about it. Couple of other things before I close this one off. I often get asked about OLED monitors as OLED is one of the best technologies for HDR TVs due to its outstanding contrast ratio and effective ability to per pixel dim. While it'd be nice to have an OLED monitor for gaming and watching HDR videos, the truth is OLED is not really well suited to a monitor. OLED struggles with image retention, otherwise known as burn-in. So in a desktop environment, items like the taskbar and windows could quite easily burn in over time. This isn't as much of a problem with TV where most of the content is just video or games. 
There are other issues as well, like full white power consumption and different subpixel sizes, but the main one for monitors is that image retention issue. I also want to make a brief mention of chroma subsampling, which is an issue with current top end 4K 144Hz G Sync HDR monitors. Chroma subsampling does reduce image quality, and it's especially noticeable during desktop usage, although during games or video playback, it should be barely noticeable in most situations. However, chroma subsampling really isn't a feature that display manufacturers are including out of choice or to save money. Rather, current DisplayPort and HDMI standards simply don't have enough bandwidth for non-subsampled 4K 144Hz 10-bit content. So if you want that frame rate and resolution with HDR, it's unfortunately a necessary evil at the moment. I expect that future monitors with newer DisplayPort standards won't need to use Chroma subsampling, but for now, it is what it is, and I'd recommend disabling subsampling and running at a lower refresh rate for desktop content, and would only consider using it if you really want to hit the top end of that refresh rate window. So to summarize, I've made a checklist for HDR monitors that I'll be using for future HDR monitor reviews, and I think buyers should also look at it to ensure that they're getting a respectable HDR capable display. And it can be pretty easy to get fooled by HDR branding on monitors that don't truly deliver a good HDR experience. So this checklist will help you sort the crap from the gems. So the first thing is that it needs to support at least 600 nits of peak brightness and 300 nits of sustained brightness. Higher brightness is marginally better and high sustained brightness is not required. It needs to support full array local dimming with at least a high double digit number of zones. I don't think edge lit dimming is good enough and of course this does not apply for OLEDs. It needs to support the ability to reproduce 125% or more of the sRGB color space, e.g. 90% plus of the DCI-P3 color space. And of course, it needs to support 10-bit processing and at least an 8-bit plus FRC panel. True 10-bit, not required. In addition to this, considering HDR is a high-end feature, you'd really want typical performance from a high-end monitor like good pixel response time, low input latency, which can be an issue with the added steps for HDR processing, and good uniformity. Also as a bonus would be things like a high resolution and refresh rate. If you're wondering how many monitors at the moment hit every key criteria in my checklist, it's, uh, it's not many. I think it could be just the latest G-Sync HDR monitors and that's it. And those have several other issues I'll talk about in the full review when I get around to doing that. HDR is definitely still in an early adopter stage, particularly for PC monitors, and I really hope people don't go out buying early models thinking they're getting features that actually aren't included. That's it for this one. A bit of a long one, but I hope those that are interested in HDR tech stuck with me the whole way through. You'll see my review of the ASUS PG27UQ shortly. That's currently being tested, so stay tuned for that. Subscribe for more in-depth monitor testing. Give this video a like if you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you in the next one.